Welcome to PartialArc.com. <laughs> Don't do that. Aww. Hi, humans. Before we kick off the episode, a few announcements. The first episode of our newest podcast, Friday Night Quests, a weekly live play D&D podcast with celebrity guests and ridiculous adventures, is finally live on PartialArc.com and iTunes for you to check out. Let us know what you think. In other news, Origins has come and gone, but for those attending, we made some exclusive announcements that we'll be sharing on PartialArc.com this week, so keep a lookout for some surprises. And finally, if you enjoy the show and you'd like to help us power this weather balloon on pure diamonds, please consider hopping on iTunes and leaving us a review. Any five-star rating and review really helps people find the show and allows us to continue doing what we love. With that said, let's start the show. Do you want to hear a story? I'm not letting go. Are you ready for this? Follow your heart. I'm going in. This. This is. This is. Blockbuster Punch-Up. Welcome to Blockbuster Punch-Up. This is episode 21. I'm your host, Jay Jones, and I'm joined by my co-host and film enthusiast, Todd G. Levin. Hello. Hello, Todd. How are you? I'm doing quite well. It's been a pretty, uh, pretty good, uh, good day out yeah, here on the weather been, balloon. It's been some, um, there's been some exciting things going on, but also in the world of the summer blockbusters that we're only yeah. able to go down and visit, um, every now and then. Every, because I every mean, now and then. I mean, you can't go at nighttime because of, no. it's just far too dangerous. It's very dangerous. You can barely go in the daytime. You have to make sure that, it's really, you know, it's kind of, uh, like the watching. classic. I, I think I've, I've looked it up this in the old catalog history books. Matthew McConaughey was in a film called Rain of fire about uh, about <laughs> dragons i think it won an academy award but in that <laughs> film you could only fight dragons in like the twilight hours and that's, that's right and that's the only time todd dawn, and i can go see movies at dawn or dusk we have a small window to uh, see these films before the flying cucumber crocodile men can come and attack <laughs> us come and get us yeah um, it really makes every movie going experience intense it's it, yeah right it's um yeah it's a, it's a very intense experience I, I highly recommend it yeah i highly recommend anyone living in the post-apocalyptic future that we are now yeah absolutely so the reason we're here today is to talk about tomorrow yes tomorrowland yes the, brad bird yeah he's back to live action i love brad bird so much and this so was uh, obviously a very anticipated film it's disney's yeah. listen it's it's not a tentpole nope. <laughs> okay completely original yeah it's not a it's not a reboot it's not a anything it's a completely original idea brad bird came out with it a few years ago when i heard about this it was like you know george clooney is signed on to star in a brad bird directed movie called tomorrowland about like the future that once was and it was super like, secretive psh, okay <laughs> like they were keeping everything under wraps like casting even within the entertainment industry itself they were keeping everything under tight tight lipped and i think it was based off of like brad bird found like some an old suitcase or some old things like disney led him into like their archives and he found like old shit from back when they were building tomorrowland oh, i didn't know that and he finding and looking through some of the stuff he was like oh Oh, I got, I, I, I gotta like, I gotta like do something about this. This, a, this is a movie. This is a time machine. <laughs> and uh, you guys have this back there. And it was interesting because there's a lot of stuff like that. Um, there's a lot of like Disney crap that Walt Disney like came up. He came up with like a museum of weird that never got made. So really, like, yeah. There's a lot of crazy cool stuff that could have been in the. Parks. I want to go to the Disneyland that never was. That never was in yeah. a parallel <laughs> dimension. That's another movie entirely. Yeah. It's parallel Disney dimension. Maybe you you can create an app where you're using Google Glass and, you and you're walking around. Around Disneyland, and, and then it's get like sad a- and depressed because it's not really there. <laughs> It's like a, it's like a macabre Disneyland with like crazy dark shit going on. Oh, it's just on. the reverse version yeah, of right, stuffed right. animal characters. So oh. you so you go to uh, you know like it's a small world is like terrifying, and then you know uh, Mr. It's Toad's a Wild sad Ride world is actually, after all, and Mr. Toad's Wild Ride is actually super optimistic, and yeah. no one dies and goes to hell at the end. Everything works out, <laughs> but. This film like had a lot of cool stuff going into it. Great, great stuff. And it's a unique thing that we don't see these days where you get these original ideas, especially powered by not like a lot of times we see that from indie directors, but from That's these right. popular directors. And, like, and from in a studio like Disney. And, you know, we really wanted to go into this and, and really love every second of it. Unfortunately, we are doing a punch up of it because we thought there was a few <laughs> things that could have been tweaked here and there. But, you know, it was on Todd's list. It was one that I was looking forward to and loving for. Uh, That's for, right. It's on my draft list. Yeah, it's on it? your draft list. Yeah. So we're, you know, we were excited to see it, but there were just a few things. So that's going to actually take us right into the, how we open the episodes with the film recap. Todd, 
kick things off. Yes, please. The film opens with a video transmission that's clearly some kind of wraparound framing device we really hope pays off. Yeah. In which George Clooney uh, and an off-screen voice of a girl can't seem to really agree on which tone to introduce the uh, introduce the story with. They are so wacky and they just don't agree with each other. No, what it's, a lovable it's duo great. they got it's, They're going just, on. you know, like, uh, the future is very scary. Oh, come on, Dad. I mean, George. <laughs> we eventually land with a young boy in the 60s named Frank, Good who's invited Frank. to a secret world by a per- precocious young girl named Athena after presenting his jetpack prototype to her father presiding over an inventor's fair. He receives a special pin and follows her to uh, where we get a first glimpse of Tomorrowland, a utopia of technological and scientific enterprise, the vision of the future from every visionary imaginable. (laughs) Fast forward to that future, or our present, where an optimistic teenager named Casey with dreams of space, adventure, exploration, and discovery is contacted by the same ageless young girl and given another pin that transports her to the same place, but only for a limited period of time. Right. She's smacking into walls and very goofy (laughs) scenes of, uh, they didn't really work out that pin commercial very well. (laughs) Fueled by her desire to return to the place, she takes off to uncover information about the pin with uh, Athena in pursuit. In an exciting but drawn-out sequence of events, we learn that there are robots. There are. That the pin is a coveted invitation to a secret world. That the young girl, Athena, is actually also a robot. A bunch of stuff explodes. We finally meet George Clooney, who is the adult Frank. And uh, he and Athena had a thing back in the day. They kind of had a thing, guys. Tomorrowland sort of ain't what it used to be. Kicked them out. And according to Frank's doomsday clock, the world is dying. But there just might be enough time to save it with the help of Casey's optimism and indomitable spirit. They hitch a ride back to Tomorrowland on a rocket ship hidden underneath the Eiffel Tower in Paris. I remember that scene. The most awesome, crazy scene. crazy. I loved it. Square off with Athena's dad, Hugh Laurie, in a climactic showdown that destroys a, a big machine feeding off our own apocalyptic fantasies and ends by recruiting other special gifted people throughout the globe to solve all the world's problems and build a better tomorrow. So, you know, we don't have to. I'm happy someone else is taking care of it because I I like my... I certainly just am not... Not going to do it. I'm not going to do... I'm going to go see Toxic Wasteland 3. Exactly. I mean, we've got a lot of blockbusters to see, guys. I don't have time to (laughs) invent shit. Are you crazy? That's right. Yeah. So we're fine. We're okay. We're good. (laughs) But that was our recap of Tomorrowland, and that'll take us into the punch up. Punch up. Ah. Oh ah, man, yeah, feels good. Just ah. testing it out for the first time. I uh, after seeing this film, I got a robot arm, and it feels good. And an interdimensional portal that came out of nowhere. Yeah, I know, right? See, look, it's like when you go to Target. Well, new Target now is terrifying, but I heard about old Target. You'd go to the stores. <laughs> And, uh, and you know, you'd go down an aisle, you grab one thing, you grab another. Well, you know, in this case, you know, you grab one robot arm, you grab one interdimensional robot portal. Arms at, at old new Target? Yeah, I know. Look, you gotta, you gotta fight through a lot of stuff, but look, the uh, interdimensional portals and the robot arms are pretty nice. I want to go to Target Land now. This episode blocked to you by Dystopian Target Land. <laughs> <laughs> so... This film has a lot of cool stuff. Tomorrowland is so much fun. It's got a lot of great stuff. And usually as we kick off our punch-ups, we like to talk about the things we liked. Yeah. And Which there is, was there's just so many. So many things. I really liked that the girl, Athena, who is actually played by Raffi Cassidy, she stole the show. Yeah. She's and incredible. I love that they made her a robot. I thought that was a really cool twist. And I thought her story with young Frank was really interesting. And I love the banter. It's like an old married couple. Yeah, and it's right. like, oh yeah, of course you would say that. She's gonna say stuff like this, but she really means that. It's like Frank. And for George Clooney, that's fun, but for this girl, I mean, come on. She really held her own in this. She scenes. held her own and like and absolutely stole the show. Uh, of course, next to uh, Keegan Michael Key yeah. and uh, and and uh, Catherine Hahn, you know, yeah, they were right. incredibly funny. Yeah, the, uh, the Toy Store with the, them actually being robots. I felt like this movie kind of harkened back to the big adventure for small children at yeah. movie days, as like you know, Escape to Witch Mountain and the Black Hole, which was obviously prominently featured in the film. Oh yeah, they had the soundtrack, vinyl, almost like uh, like very prominently featured when she puts the pan the pin down. Mm-hmm. It says the Black Hole. You know, and it 
the movie sort of reminded me of that kind of stuff, and it was really fun. Rocket ship shooting out of the Eiffel Tower was so much fun and ridiculous. I mean, ridiculous. G- George Melies would be just so jealous yeah. that, that he didn't get to see this moment that, like, a rocket ship <laughs> was under the Eiffel Tower. It's like, yeah, it's this here. So much great design. So much fun So much stuff. fun and creative stuff and all that kind of stuff. You know, we just wish that... <laughs> How this was packaged and delivered right. might have been a bit cleaner. And that kind of launches us a little bit into the cons, the negatives we had with the film. So the first thing I think we struggled with was the framing device of the film. Yeah, absolutely. How it opened, how it closed was just, what? They, Why they is this did there? this weird thing where they, they put in sort of a Shane Black type of wraparound yeah. framing device where... Did you... they just finish watching Kiss Kiss Bang Bang? And they were like, <laughs> that, let's do that. Yeah, where you're basically getting this, you know, it's clearly going to be at the end of the film Mm -hmm. which in a way if you don't do it right it sort of subverts all of the danger and the tension in the film because you already know that it works out yeah we're like we haven't gotten to this scene yet so i know it's gonna happen and everything's gonna be fine and i've i've heard uh i've read some things and heard some things from people that that was actually a really late addition in the film especially and i think i would imagine that it's due to when they were tracking it or basically uh doing test audience screenings and everything people were asking Where's George Clooney? That's probably what it was, yeah. Like, this is great and all, but where's George? He's all over the posters. You've you've used his name in all of the promotional materials, He's, except he doesn't show up until three quarters of the way in the movie. Biggest thing in the film, yeah. Absolutely. So the way they did it, the method just didn't really fit, and it was starts and stops. Yeah, it kind of slows down the film quite a bit. It does this like, open the film and I'm ready to see like fantastical stuff or be like slowly dipped into a story as things are peeled back for Which they me. did in the form of his, when, it, when the movie actually begins. Yeah, I, I remember watching the film and the I was kid. like, all right, I mean, when's the movie actually going to yeah, start? Get, let's get past this. And once it did, once we got to the kid and he's like, he gets off the bus and we're in the mid '60s, mm-hmm. and he's going to like Epcot. He's going to this like Inventors Fair, the World's Fair in 1964 or something like that. I love that that opening, but mm-hmm. it just the way that the film opened, it kind of tripped on itself a little bit, right? And it didn't really, uh, it didn't really do what it felt like it could have done. And it's also serving up that like big thesis statement it's trying to make. Like, oh right, yeah, in a huge, over the top, repeated way. And that you know that was just something we were we just didn't really like. Absolutely. And then that led into what happens next, right? We meet this girl. And she's nice enough, except it's a little confusing in the beginning what she's doing, right? Going to NASA. She's, she's, she's doing down. something at it NASA. It looked like for a second I was like, is this like a terrorist Is she going to blow up, blow up uh, uh, the launch pad? Is this in the 80s and this is Challenger? Is <laughs> oh this what's going God. on? What's going on here? Like, And what we're talking about here is it really comes down to the structure. Yeah, the structure of the film. Yeah. And and what, you know, after this moment where, you know, we it's a little confusing, uh, we might think she's a terrorist, the movie trips up on itself. What it really gets into, what it really gets bogged down with is her journey. This Raffi Cassidy character, Athena, gives her this pin, but then kind of doesn't give her the pin. Right. And then, you know, because she wants her to, like, find it on her own, but and then she's, she's like, like, chasing her down. And she's exploring Tomorrowland, which is a little strange because it's fun and fantastical if that was the first way we're introduced to Tomorrowland. Yes. The problem is the first time we're introduced to Tomorrowland is with the kid. Thank you. And we get a lot of Tomorrowland exactly. with the kid. So when we're spending a lot of these scenes of her, like, exploring Tomorrowland via the pin it's not that exciting because we just got all that literally five minutes prior yeah. we got all that we needed from the beginning of the movie about what tomorrowland is we got our cold opener of like Dana tomorrowland and i get that it's a cool fun effect to have when she touches it like she's you know she's in the car and she holds it and she it looks like she's like driving above the cornfields of tomorrowland which i guess in the future or the alternate reality everybody just eats only bread but yeah only wheat only wheat uh, is the only product they all well that was an invention they were just like we can eat cookies all day <laughs> this was the number one invention we I, had. I guess nothing has been invented since sliced bread in no, that world that was the, that's the number one thing they always refer back to right. is sliced bread um but yeah that's a very cool effect but once we're already in the world we don't need to spend that much time dipping into it again right so what does that mean it means that you need to choose how, yeah. sh- how to reveal Tomorrowland. How are we getting into this film? Are we getting yeah. into it from Frank's perspective? From his perspective. Are we getting into it from her perspective? Fr- from the comedic perspective of her running into walls five times. <laughs> right. Uh, she did run into a lot of... You she know, really figured that 
uh, effect out quite late. Like, she did it a bunch until she suddenly realized, like, when she was in the dad's room yeah. and picked it up and, like, hit the door and then proceeded to also go down the stairs afterwards, it was like, how many times do you need to know that you're still in your house before it, it, you figure this out? And then we get this kind of extended road trip chase sequence yeah, in the she, middle of the movie which yeah. was kind of weird and i think didn't need to be as long as it was where she's trying to go identify the pin and find out about it by the way we've already met the pin twice so we kind of know about the we pin. know what's going on with the pin right and, and a lot of these scenes are her just asking what's the pin when at it we already know what's going on yeah with the pin. right and we should be one step behind her or with her exactly not one step ahead of her we That's shouldn't a be little... sitting there in these scenes going like we know what it is you're gonna get there you're gonna <laughs> gonna get there eventually you're gonna eventually meet george clooney because oh my god we're halfway through the film we haven't met george clooney yet i mean i'm pretty sure it's it's more than halfway through the film and we haven't met george clooney and it's true like as much as i love a lot of the individual things in these different scenes i love keys scene in the toy shop i love (laughs) some of the stuff with george very funny george clooney i love the eiffel tower but like a lot of that a lot of that road trip is like really fluffy and there's like you know she like hits the kid out of the car and then she steals another car and there's like all these weird ways for her to get to Tomorrowland. Right. So it's the film is a very elongated for for really no reason. It just seems yeah. like they're filling out time. It's it's in order to introduce some really interesting gadgets that unfortunately never get used ever again. Yeah, and I feel like some of the stuff is just to play with gadgets. It's like, well, we want to have the time bomb in there, so we got to have a scene with the time bomb. We want to have this scene where um, I guess Coca Cola sponsored the film, where she <laughs> teleports. She teleports to France, there you which go. was which was cool. It was like, oh, this is really gonna hurt, and like you know, you're gonna want to kill yourself or something. It was. It was fun dialogue, but like, was it really needed? No, I guess for the Coca Cola commercial it was, but <laughs> otherwise it wasn't really necessary. But cool yourself off after a nice transport. Yeah, drink Coca Cola. So that was, you know, the structure in this film. It was just a little bit all over the place. We wished it was a little bit more streamlined, That's and right. that with most of this journey, we were on the same page as our protagonist, not ahead of them right. such as Tomorrowland and is. that some of the things that were introduced were actually integral to the story instead of just ornamentation that was really fun to look at and really cool ideas to explore but we're just sort of like walking through a toy store being like oh gee wow and then not look being able this, to buy anything at the end this. of the day the time bomb doesn't come back no. the no, no, the I, only I can name thing, a bunch of stuff and it just does not come back the only thing that they plant and pay off is the tachyon seeing into the future moment yeah, that's the only real one. That which was off. a great payoff, which, which goes payoff. to show, like, if you plant something and then, you know, pay it off later, that's why you did that. Exactly. That's but why that was you the, do things. But it was the only one, and they introduced it at the end of the film. And they did it at the end of the film. And then a scene later, they did it again. That's right. So the structure was a little bit muddy. Right. The last bit is the message of the film. Overall, the message is a bit muddy. I mean, we've got this optimism wins out over pessimism concept However, most of the film, even though the world within the film keeps telling us that we have to stop being worried about our own demise and think about what we used to think about, which is the future and promise and all these kinds of things, except the film spends most of its time (laughs) grilling us about how we talk about mostly pessimistic uh, Pope's, you know, apocalyptic fantasies, right? And how we're gonna die, and the doomsday is upon us, and you know, and there's really no hope anymore. It's kind of an apocalyptic film in its own way. It's like the apocalypse is coming in 54 days. All these things are gonna happen, <laughs> and the world's gonna be destroyed. By the way, don't like this kind of stuff <laughs> because see, it's bad. It's a bit hypocritical, it's isn't it? It's a bit hypocritical. And well, then we get to the ending, and right? The, and then they're like, "We can't do this anymore." And well, we get to the ending, and they're like, "We can do this." this you and you and only these people who are really smart and and all this kind of stuff and it's basically saying that you know uh instead of all of us if we all band together you know i think part of the message is supposed to be if we all band together and believe we can make beautiful things happen right that's that's what is on the board right you know uh, that they want to have that's on the the t-shirt that's on the billboard but unfortunately what what i felt was um only geniuses can save the world only geniuses can (laughs) fix this problem everybody else is watching this film if you're not a genius sorry if you're not richard branson elon musk or mother Teresa, or like these types of people who are just like incredible you know beautiful spirits that are awesome and they tried to like i just call elon musk a beautiful spirit just a beautiful spirit that elon musk (laughs) 
and they tried to fix that a little bit at the end where they were showing like an artist playing guitar somewhere yeah, like or a like homeless somebody, artist you know? somebody painting somewhere but they did that a little bit late really most of the film was like you've got to invent rocket ships and i was like what about if i no 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 no, no. just rock okay. ships. what, what, what if i just future. think about really really inventive things uh, that's nice, but you're not getting a pin, and you're not coming to Tomorrowland. You're not coming to Tomorrowland. So guys. that's the thing. It's like we all kind of want to go to Tomorrowland, right? Yeah. And the message of the film is only a small group of people get to go to Tomorrowland. Yeah. Everybody else gets to stay in crappy Earth. And by the way, Tomorrowland is also kind of crappy right now. Yeah. Because we have to rebuild it, and it's just like it, it's kind of like an onus on our shoulders. The yeah. message that I was left with was. Ooh, you know, we got a we yeah. got a long way to go before we get back just to optimism. To optimism. Back to zero. Yeah. We got a long way to go before we can look forward. We have a lot of things. If this movie was like a like a post recession movie. Right. Right. This was like there was like so much national uh like guilt debt going on here, <laughs> like pessimistic debt going on. And you know, that's important to shine a light on that kind of stuff, but we've heard about that stuff a lot. They even reference it so much in the film of like how we hear about that a lot but like it would have been nicer as you said for them to kind of introduce a more optimistic way where they inception that idea into our minds at the end of the film where we're leaving being happy and excited to go you know what that idea I was thinking of, maybe I will think about that idea a little bit more. And maybe I'll do this because I'm leaving the theater on a high. I'm not leaving on the theater being like, oh, jeez. Uh, well, I don't, I want to repress that feeling because that made me feel sad. So I'm going to go home and watch that Walking Dead episode I wanted to catch up on. That's and, right. And the film becomes part of the cycle of the thing it was trying to address. That is exactly it. So... I just feel the message was too over the top, too much on our heads, and it just didn't really get and, in there the way they were hoping to, and a bit, I think. And, and, and missed the boat a little bit. Yeah. It, it had some well-intentioned ideas behind it, but unfortunately, it tried to sell optimism with cynicism. Yeah, which is not the way you're probably supposed by, to do by that. By highlighting. It's like optimism by uh, by opposing be cynicism. Be happy, damn it. <laughs> just be freaking happy. And and rather, you know, isn't it better to make a film? I mean, there's a movie that came out earlier this year. I know it's completely different than everything that we talk about usually. But if any of you saw Paddington, <laughs> yes, that movie about that bear. I haven't seen it, but you have given it so much praise. Because Paddington is a fantastic film. It's the type of film that I would love as a kid. It's the type of film that I loved as an adult. It's the type of film that I will show to my kids. Mm -hmm. And there, those are, honestly, in today's day and age, those are few and far between. Kids films, family-friendly films that I actually am like, wow, I would love to show this to my children in the future. Because it just has a positive message, delivers it positively. Any bad elements in the film are sort of cartoonish and basically live, leaves you with this feeling of like warmth and happiness inside. Right. That the world can be a better place if we just you know, love one another a little bit and, and remember to not be so much of an asshole all the time and everything. Right. Whereas this movie was like, you know, it was much more asshole than love. Yeah, I mean, if Fast and the Furious is any example, you leave that film wanting to drive real fast, I should leave Tomorrowland wanting to invent shit. And that's not the case. There you go. So, guys, those were our pros and cons. Now that'll take us into the punch-up. So, yeah, this is not really, this is an easy punch-up, unfortunately, you know? Right. Because it's, it's kind of simple. I mean, I think that they, in trying to fix something later in the film, the, the George Clooney showing up so late, I think they made more problems for the film. Mm -hmm. I think that's like really what happened. So for me, it's kind of like you you use a lot of the the film exactly the way it is, just rearrange it a little bit, and I think you have a little bit better of a of a movie, at least structurally. You know, goes a little forward a little faster. So start with Frank in 1964. Uh, he's a boy. His father doesn't believe in him. He's this little inventor kid who lives out in the middle of nowhere. He's sort of a, a you know, a, a genius. He's a, he's a young little genius who's tinkering away at toys. Yeah. Maybe he used to play with, like, he's given away his Legos and connects and all this kind of stuff and Lincoln Logs, and he's turned them in, traded them in for his, uh, his father's chemistry set, and then on to like bigger and better and things. keyboards, and, you know, he's looking up things like, I hear they're building, like, computers. It's like, shut up, son. Yeah, <laughs> right, exactly. And he's just... Just like he knows how circuitry works and all this kind of stuff. The, the contrast is we get this like, wow, gee, you know, and then we go to this girl who's maybe, maybe she's pessimistic to yeah. start off, right? Maybe she's a teenager, an angsty teenager who 
is sort of like, you know, who, you know, has dreams to get out of whatever situation she's in or or has dreams to be bigger than where she's from and all this kind of stuff. But she treats other people, you know, she's a bit of a brat and she like treats other people and like whatever. One day a pin shows up in her lap. And this is kind of like the pin is going to help shape how she's going to eventually there you go. Yeah. be a innovator or an inventor. But, you know, it's now working with, it's working with the clay. It's not working with something that's existing. Because in this film, she's like an existing innovator, an inventor. And she just has to, like, get to Tomorrowland or I she's guess, like... like a, like a thief, really, and like a criminal. <laughs> right, right. But that's true. But she has the, you know, she already has the magic stuff, right? There you go, yeah. Which is, which is weird in the film because it's kind of like, you just have to keep having the magic stuff. And it's like, <laughs> well, I already have the magic stuff. And I think what's an interesting thing that comes into this story, too, is how, like, when the movie starts, she is trying to sabotage them wrecking down the, you know, the space shuttle center, to the, the Kennedy Space Center, right? Hey, so, yeah, keep that right so so keep that yeah. there but what's a good arc for her is she's looking at it from the wrong angle there you she's go she's looking at it from you know how you know we got to stop them from tearing this old thing down when maybe she should be looking towards how can we bring it back how can we fix it how can we bring the space shuttle or how can we make this relevant again or how can we innovate off of what's being changed? that's a really interesting idea because maybe she has part of this this sort of brattiness that she has or disdain or, or whatever is a disdain for like the present and she has this idea of the past was better. Yeah, the past has always been better. It's always got all this cool stuff, and we were so much cooler back then. When the space program was alive, we were we were better human beings, but now look at us like, ugh, we're the ones that are, you know, it's like almost instead of the movie saying like, we gotta, you're too pessimistic, world, maybe it's the girl. You're darn millennials. Maybe it's the girl who's like, who's pessimistic. Yeah. And, and then, the you know, there is magic out there in the world, and she just has to be shown what it is. So she she's always trying to hearken back to this place in the past and like how it was done then and nothing is done well anymore. And that's very relevant to people these yeah. days too. I mean, there's plenty of people that are like, oh man, if I could have been in the 60s, oh man, if exactly. I could have been alive in the 70s or the 80s or whatever period you loved, it's fun to kind of put that on its head to be like, yeah, that's all cool and they did a lot of cool stuff back then, but we're here now. Like, what can we do now to make this really interesting? So she's this way. She's a bit of antiquarian. She she uh, has a bit of pessimism and, and cynicism for the present day. She gets this pin, right? Mm -hmm. And she's given a moment. Maybe she disappears for a moment. So instead of us... You know, so, you know, if we keep because we said we can't do it three times, right? Maybe she, like, disappears and is just, like, and comes back and is like, what? Like, what did, What just happened? Where was I? Or whatever. Right. And and then, you know, she, like, tries to learn about the pin or whatever. She says to her brother, like, I, you know, it's, like, a magical place and, you know, all this, like, crazy stuff. And everybody starts thinking she's a little bit nuts, right? Yeah. She, she's helped in one of these situations, these confrontations with these bad people, you know, G-men looking kind of people, right? Right. The smiling uh, robot killers. The men in black uh, yeah, sort basically. of people, you know, that were done very comedically in this film that I very much liked. Yeah, that was very enjoyable. Uh, so that it's not so scary for kids, right? Um, and uh, and she's helped and defended by this diminutive, awesome martial arts, like, kick-ass kick -ass girl. robot girl, uh, this Raffi Cassidy character who, in our version, uh, again, steals the show. And she tells her all these things, and then you, we immediately go straight to, you know, end of the first act or something, we're at Frank's place. Yeah. Have that, you know, scene at the Eiffel Tower come maybe at the middle of point of the movie, and then they get to Tomorrowland, except when they get there, they're all excited that it's going to be this, like, utopia that, like, you know, that we have seen as an audience member. Right. And we get there, and maybe, yeah, maybe it's destroyed. Maybe yeah. there's something wrong with it's it. It's a little bit like getting to Oz. Like, I don't know if anyone saw the film Return to Oz. There you go. But there's a Oz is broken. Like, come back and like Oz is gone. Nobody, you know, the yellow brick roads messed up. Everyone's missing. Like what happened to the magical place that we're used and to? And none of them expected it. Yeah. And Athena, this... Frank, or Casey are like, what is this? And they've been telling her all about the great place that it was. And it can be and a little suddenly, bit of like, you know, they want to get back. Like even Athena, it wasn't necessarily that she was thrown out, but she couldn't figure out how to get back. She was recruiting people and her old doorways didn't work anymore. Yeah, and you know, yeah. Frank too wanted to get back. Because maybe somebody was closing them, right? Exactly. And, they, and so it is a big shock to the audience. It is a big shock to them. Instead of this, like, it's going to be bad. It's going to be bad. It's going to be bad. Oh, it's bad. Like we said it was going to be. Like it's... <laughs> right, right. 
Like right. It's, it's it subverts more, the expectation. Yeah. It's more of a shock for the audience to come there and see like, oh, this isn't like the commercial. This isn't like anything we saw previously about Tomorrowland. And then we can get into the, you know, the tachyon thing and the yeah. pushing messages into people's head. And, and they're trying maybe to make Hugh Laurie more of a villain because yeah. in this film he like he dies like in most kid films there's a lot of death in kids films for which villains. by the way that's athena's dad yeah it's athena's dad <laughs> and they just like kill her kill him and, and like, it's like not he, a big deal he just like gets a thing dropped on him and like we're like oh all right i guess he was a villain because he's like a villain in the last 10 seconds of the film and right we're like okay well, there we go, all so, wrapped up. So I think make him someone who, when they first get there, welcomes them and is just like, thank God you've come back. Right. You know, the Tomorrowland is broken. We need your help. And these three people are going to be, you know, what's the opposite of the the four horsemen of the apocalypse? Like right. the three angels of the Renaissance or something, right? Mm-hmm. The, the Athena, Frank, older Frank, and Casey are like these three characters that are going to somehow fix it. Along the way, we learn about what happened to Tomorrowland. We get more of Frank and Athena's backstory, you know, what happened with them. We have a lot of this internal conflict with Casey that she used to think that the future of the past was brighter and that she wanted to live in the past, but then she's learning now but that it's like... Had some, it's had some problems and it's had some things that have kept it from being what she hoped it would have been. Yeah. You know, it's like never meet your heroes, really. There it is. Yeah, exactly. She gets exactly... It's a be careful knows, what you wish maybe, for story. You know what? Hugh Laurie's character can be a fake old scientist from the 60s or whatever that she meets as a hero. Oh. He was her hero. She read a lot of stuff about him and like yeah. was really all about the science and the new things he was coming up to, but then he just disappeared and yeah, he just vanished suddenly for disappeared years. one day. And no right. one could ever find out, but she was a huge fan of his. So that makes a really nice personal connection between him and her so that in this third act when we're slowly revealing what's actually going on in Tomorrowland, they've created more of a closer personal connection. There so you now go. she has a conflict of which side of the fence she lands on. Does she land on Frank's side, who she's been traveling with and Athena's? Or did she land on Hugh Laurie's side? And it kind of reminds me of um, the the antagonist in Up. Exactly. That that adventurer who they love, this adventurer, but then he, you know, he goes there and he basically kind of, uh, over time, he... He went a little nuts. He goes a little crazy. He ventured too hard, guys. <laughs> it is possible to over-adventure. And, and, you know, he goes a little nuts and he, it, it's revealed that he's actually the one that starts closing the portals. So we have a face of a villain that we need to destroy in order to save it. Exactly. And I think how you could play this a little bit too, and this might be a little bit of a left field with the film but like the film was all about like the real problem is like we you know we want to get more people to Tomorrowland but Tomorrowland's not as cool anymore and that's because like the world is being destroyed what was strange is like a lot of the film is pulling these innovative these geniuses to Tomorrowland and like the world is going under and it's like yeah because you pulled all the geniuses <laughs> and innovators to Tomorrowland <laughs> And what could be... It should really, be for everybody, right? right? And yeah. what the villain thrust of this film could be is Hugh Laurie pooled all Did these scientists purpose, and huh? people. He hey, pulled them out of the world. That's great. And he's like, ah, this is going to be the new Eden. It's going to be Tomorrowland is what I control. And then closes the portals. And closes the portals to keep everybody else out. But what he doesn't realize is by closing the portals and then killing the natural world, mm-hmm. Earth, that's in turn destroying eating away at Tomorrowland because they're linked if Earth dies Tomorrowland can't exist right he believes that that's that's his utopia right is no more Earth I was an outcast there maybe she learned something that he, he was controversial he was a controversial scientific figure no one really believed in him you know or even but it, years later his ideas flourished and became something brilliant or even something like he still wants to keep those worlds closed off maybe he thinks if Earth dies Tomorrowland can live on but the reason why we need Tomorrowland Tomorrowland can almost be like an inventor's neverland an inventor's like magic place for imagination like i like the idea of tomorrowland almost like being like an abstract world in itself and somewhere somewhere that any of us can access with the right amount of imagination right right? like that light bulb that goes above off of our heads that's an access point you've just been you just had a vision of tomorrow of tomorrowland and i like that being an abstract thing and when you close off tomorrowland to the world then that's when we start to get in this turmoil people aren't thinking of new ideas and you're you're keeping all of these in inventors and these new ideas for yourselves you're stripping it from earth so what we need to do is we need to open the doors to tomorrowland again which 
this film was kind of like, yeah, everybody should just come to Tomorrowland, but only the special people. <laughs> but it's like, what about Earth? The whole point is they should be going back to Earth exactly. to fix it, but still tapping into the magic of Tomorrowland. Absolutely. And what you, what I think you could have done, which might be a little bit of a left to this storyline, is I feel like you wouldn't, you shouldn't really show too much of actual Tomorrowland, the magic of Tomorrowland, because they do a lot of cool stuff with the swimming pools and stuff like that. But it would be cool that. The first time young Frank sees this in the beginning, we just see him like he do- maybe he doesn't make it in. Maybe he gets to the small world ride and sees them go through, but he doesn't get in in time. Or maybe, you know, he gets there and he's on the jetpack, but he's like flying through the crowds and way in the distance, he sees something. He sees something and he's pulled back. And he's pulled back. He just doesn't make it to Tomorrowland. Right. And then when we're doing this dip in with the pin, we start to get a little bit more of like, whoa, Tomorrowland looks crazy, but still keeping it very much at a distance. Yeah. So that we're teasing this magical world a little bit more because even though they do a lot of really cool stuff with Tomorrowland and show all this fun thing things it it's a little bit of like holding the monster back a little bit of holding it back so that when we finally get there you know the realization isn't as much tomorrowland isn't the prize the tomorrowland is the fuel the imagination fuel for the people back home that's right like this is a magical place to tap into but you have to go back home home needs your help tomorrowland doesn't need your help tomorrowland's this great scientific future place that Hugh Laurie just wants to live in forever. It's a creator's space. It's a creator's space. That people can, you know, it's a, it's a space that's in all of us, that's in all of our imaginations that some of us only get a chance to glimpse at every once in a while. But true creators and inventors, he created a way for people to actually access it and go there like it's a physical place. Like it's a physical place. So that they could try out their wildest dreams and, you know, with where money is no object and there's no limit to any of their imagination. Exactly. But if eventually take it back take it back to and benefit the world with it but he twisted that to be like no this this fake world is now the real world now this is what we're going to be in and that that doesn't really matter which maybe he's been lying to all the inventors there and says the world outside has died earth has has already died exactly and we're the only ones that's left so them coming in they get quarantined and all that kind of stuff people and all the inventors maybe maybe you bring in some inventors some old guys right you can have like some old past inventors you get you get isaac sir isaac newton is still alive in this neverland of inventors you know einstein you can have all these guys are still alive and they help you know they they learn that there's like new blood and the earth is actually not dead and that the hugh laurie character is actually been like imprisoning them in this imagination space that in the meantime time has gone kaput because there's just no juices anymore and it seems pretty pessimistic that the earth is dead and that's a little bit more less pessimistic of a disney film too to be like hey tomorrowland isn't just for the smart people which it does for most of the film until it shows you you know the kid playing guitar and stuff on the street it's for everybody anybody can have a eureka moment anyone can tap into tomorrowland but hugh laurie just wants it for himself he just he's creating an elitist society right the whole point of these characters is they should be breaking down this society and instead of you know putting the onus on us us mm-hmm. as the audience that we're the ones that are killing the world right which you know is a certain amount of truth and responsibility and that's nice the movie because it's a disney film after all it's yeah. a kid's film right it's a family film puts the onus on this bad guy who you don't want to be like this guy you don't want to take things the lesson is you don't want to uh, you know uh, close yourself off and and take things for yourself and be selfish the and key to to the earth flourishing is selflessness. And that's a little bit too of like a little inception of that idea of saying, hey, you can't live in this imaginative world. At the end of the day, we all live in this regular world. And the end of the day, you have to go back to the real world. What are you bringing to the table? What, what you can bringing, you? What are you taking back from your imagination, from the world of tomorrow, Tomorrowland, into our world, giving to it as a gift that sharing your invention with the world on and on through the ages? You know, you can imagine that maybe this place uh, existed in some capacity before and it's where we came up with the idea to go to space and you know to create yeah, we, we tapped into it somewhere that the rocket was there and that this was there i like that it. electricity imagination you know we could such, harness electricity imagination is such an abstract idea tomorrowland should be abstract as well there it, it shouldn't is. be one thing because what if when we achieve rockets then tomorrowland is you know past land it's not future land it should always be this 
you know, not perfectly defined future place that we're always tapping into to constantly innovate and take those next steps forward. And you come back at the end of the film. You right. come back and I think the final is her completing her arc, accepting that this space shuttle place is going to get taken down, but what's going to go up in its place? What's the next step for Maybe what she do? goes and contacts one of these uh, commercial space, space agencies exactly. and starts working on, you know, one of these uh, these apps or she goes online and she realizes that there's an entire world of creators out there that are doing crazy stuff. It's just that people aren't as focused on it anymore. You know, people are more focused in the news on like, you know, things dying everywhere and all and this kind of stuff. And now she can be a recruiter like Athena. Yeah. She can go out and help recruit others and help and spread more. And now she is once again, like the others, tapping into tomorrow. And she appreciates her own time and place instead of hearkening back to a, a time that she couldn't have existed in anyway. Yeah. All right, guys. So that was our punch up for Tomorrowland. And that'll take us right into our smash up. Smash, smash, smash. All right, this is Blockbuster Smash Up. This is where Todd and I will take a globally accepted good film and smash it with a globally accepted bad film to create a new narrative and new film for you right here, right now. A globally uh, amazing film is what it's going to be, yeah. All right, so for this episode, I have the globally accepted bad film and Todd is the globally accepted good film. Yes, I do. So on the count of three, let us smash them together. Yes. One, One, two, two, three. three. The never-ending story. Oh, (laughs) Boy. Is Kazam the one with Shaq? Kazam with Shaq. <laughs> he is a genie that lives in a boombox, oh a magical boombox, oh Todd. So the never-ending story. The never-ending story, of course, chosen because I think it's the superior example to a movie such as Tomorrowland. About imagination. About imagination, where a boy is reading a magical book that seems to come alive and reference even him while he's reading it. Right, and it he talks to him. becomes part of the story while he's reading it, and it's sort of about the power of imagination and overcoming your fears. Uh, and um, and by the end of the film, interestingly enough, I think there's a thesis that happens in the movie. The movie is about the story within the book is happening because he's reading it. Oh. But what the movie sort of, I think the meta sort of thing that the movie is trying to say is that by you watching the film, the story within the film about the boy reading the book is, is happening actually too. happening. That's I think pretty cool. That's kind of, I think, what the, the movie is like trying to say. It's like a weird ring moment. Like, because you're watching this, it's doing this. and That's exactly, it's this meta moment that is actually really brilliant and makes, and just fills me with imagination and, like, I, I feel like I have power. It gets the, the turbines spinning in your head. That because yeah. I have watched this film, these characters have been able to live again in some capacity. So that's never ending story. So Kazam, um, <laughs> surprising that it's a bad <laughs> Bad film. Ugh, geez. How can it's I another, It's about a boy as well. It's about a boy oh, um, so we got, who we doesn't got... find a never ending story. He finds a magical boom box. No. Yeah. It's, it's a boom box. It's like, like those big, huge boom boxes. Fantastic. Yes. You know, I forget if he rubs it or he turns on a station or something. He can't rub it. it. Yeah, he can't rub it. Um, <laughs> oh, probably turn, he probably turns up the volume beyond like crazy. <laughs> no, no one would ever turn up the volume this loud. That's ludicrous volume. And, uh, and Kazam pops out of it, who is a genie trapped in a boombox. Who is, is Shaquille O'Neal. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, that's all you really need to know about that film. It is, just imagine whatever kind of scenario comes after that, and it's even more <laughs> ridiculous. I promise you. So that's Kazam. So Never Ending Story and Kazam. Okay, okay. How the heck do these films mix together? All right, so I think we start with a, a little kid. who's yeah. about a young boy. Okay. But it's a boy in like an old farmland. It's like an old <laughs> fantasy time. So almost like the setting of Never Ending Story. Okay. And he finds a book. And the book is about a future world <laughs> in, in, a, in a city. And it's about a... Uh, he, he has, he, he's like, you know, maybe he's bullied by yeah. other townsfolk. About you other, know, like, kids in the neighborhood. Uh, in the neighborhood. And he finally, like, he, he takes refuge in, like, the uh, the blacksmith's, uh, you know, Yeah, and he finds of, this book about a place called... he finds called, this uh, old scroll. And it's a book of, of like, the place called New York City. <laughs> and uh, he's like, this magical land of New York City. And he opens it up. And inside, he's, instead of Falcor, it's, it's Kazam <laughs> is his friend. <laughs> And uh, he's reading about a boy who lives in New York City yeah. and is like, you know, and, and is friends with this uh, this boombox toting genie. Right. Yep. 
you know, whose name is Sha- Shaq. Or, his name's Shaquille O'Neal. Yeah, his name is Shaquille O'Neal. He was you previously know. a famous basketball player. Named but he, Shazam. Named Kazam. <laughs> named Kazam. <laughs> and, he, uh, and he got trapped to this boombox, and now he's just known as Shaquille O'Neal. And through the adventures of this boy working with... Uh, Previously Kazam and now Shaquille O'Neal <laughs> um, is learning about life in New York City. Meanwhile, like in his regular life, which is not interesting to him at all, there's like flying dragons and like magical wolves. <laughs> but, but what he, he's really interested in is, 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 is the like 80s, the tax, 80s and 90s. taxis, like, you taxis, know, taxis, what's going on with taxis. Like, and then he basically starts, he comes to realize this boy in the mythological land of, uh, of the never ending story that um, essentially like. He is the boy in this mythical place called New York City. Yeah. And that Shazam slash, I keep saying Shazam. It's Kazam. Sure. Kazam slash uh, Shaquille O'Neal is actually granting him the wishes in his everyday life. Yeah. Because they're coming true, you know. In his in his town. And the, right. The bullies, he wishes you know, for a piece of pizza. <laughs> and, and a box of pizza just shows up. <laughs> and, you know, the story I feel like ends, he opens his own pizza shop, and the bullies that used to fight with him come to his shop now. And they're like, this, you know, listen, uh, Antoine of us. <laughs> yeah, Antoine of us is definitely his name. We used to not like you, but we got to say, this breaded cheeseling with tomato sauce on it, it is, is fantastic. And he goes, uh-uh, it's fly. And they're like, ooh, fly. <laughs> and, he, uh, and he brings the magic and wonder of, of, uh, New York, of, of Shaquille of, O'Neal. Of 90s New York City yeah, and Shaquille in, O'Neal back to the, uh, the Shire, so to, to speak. To the Shire never-ending story. <laughs> so what the heck is this movie called? The never-ending Shaquille O'Neal. Never-ending Shaquille O'Neal? Yeah, I think of the never He never ending. ends. Shaquille O'Neal will always be there for us in our hearts whenever we need him to the, solve problems. The never Shaquille Kazam. Oh my God. All right. <laughs> That concludes episode 21 and our punch-up of Tomorrowland. We'll be posting a new episode every other week, and if you'd like to download more episodes or check out other similar podcasts, head over to partialarc.com. That's arc with a C. Of course, you can email us any questions at blockbusterpunchup at gmail.com or follow us on Twitter and Instagram at partialarc. And you can follow Todd on Twitter and Instagram at TG11. Thanks for listening, and see you on the next episode of Blockbuster Punch-Up! Let's go home.